Every day, ordinary people make extraordinary choices as they negotiate unpredictable pathways to the peak of their expectations without ever taking the time to enjoy the view. Join me, Tish Tyndall, at this panoramic viewpoint of astonishing personal and professional progress as we find out why my next guest is living the fabulous life. Abby and Oliver, welcome so much. How are you doing? You're, you're, you've been in Manchester, come from Manchester, gone to Hollywood, and now you're on The Fabulous Life. I can't thank you enough. How are you today, darling? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. How, how are you doing? I'm doing great, but you're in Hollywood Boulevard. Is that right? I'm right on Hollywood Boulevard, yeah, right behind the, um, the TCL Chinese Theatre where they do all the, uh, the Oscars and the movie premieres. I literally live right there, so I'm, oh. in, the, I'm in the thick of it right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. Well, I'm in Lossiemouth, sort of just behind the golf club. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, not, it's maybe not quite so exciting, but it is, <laughs> it, it is beautiful. Yeah. Abby, you know, I've been doing a lot of research on you, and, and wow, what, what an incredible career you have had you know, already, and you know, what are you, 19, something like that? I don't know. <laughs> I'm 30. I look, I look about 20, but I'm 30. <laughs> so how did it all start? What did you, you know, when did you decide to go into dance? I was, I think I was three years old and I'd seen Michael Flatley, Lord of the Dance, actually, um, the Irish dancing, I think it was like a touring show at the time. And I was just like, I want to try it. So I convinced my parents to take me and, and try Irish dancing. Um, and at the age of three, I just, that was it. I knew that that was all I wanted to do. So I went from Irish dancing, then I went to the traditional tap, ballet, jazz, um, musical theater. I even uh, dabbled in the freestyle world a little bit. I did some of the freestyle competitions, quickly did not enjoy that and got out very no. fast. <laughs> Crazy world. Um, yep. From there. Um, I just basically kept kept going. Um, I went I went to a dance school when I was 16 in Manchester, um, and so I did some formal training. Um, I got very discouraged after that and ended up actually going to university to get a traditional degree. And funny funny enough, um, they placed me on a study abroad in North Carolina in the USA. So I did a study abroad year, and that university over there happened to specialize in technical jazz. And in America, it's very different. You can actually pick credits that have nothing to do with your course. So unlike in the UK, where you pick your degree, you, you're assigned your classes and you kind of move forward with that group. In the US, you're just picking and choosing and, you know, they basically recommend you to do these, but you can absolutely take extra if you want. So I said, okay, let me, let me take a jazz class. Like I'd love to see an American jazz class. Um, and that was it. It just kickstarted that passion inside me again. And from that from that year, being out in North Carolina, um, I was like, I'm going to finish my degree. I'm going to finish what I came here to do, but I, I want to dance. Like, I, I need to dance. I need to, I need to be in the performing arts. There's nothing else that I want to do. And did you find at the time that people thought maybe dance wasn't the industry to go into? I, I had so much pushback. It, w it was crazy from... I love my parents very much, but they had no semblance of what a dance or performing arts career could look like. They had nobody to look to. So of course, they were terrified of, of pushing me to do this very, very unstable career. You know, all they did, all, every time they Googled it or looked it up, it just said, you know, unstable. Um, the money is low. You have to, there's so much competition. So I had that side of it. And then my school teachers, because I went to a very, very good school um, in Manchester. It's one of the top schools in the UK. They actually had a, when I told them I was leaving to pursue dance, um, they dragged me into the office and the headmaster basically told me, you're going to fail. You should be a, a lawyer or a doctor. We can get you into Oxford. You have straight A's. And it was just from, all, and even my friends at the time, they said, what are you doing? You're so stupid. You are never going to succeed at this. You should you know, come to continue school with us and we'll all be, we'll all have really good careers. And I just, I, I just knew, I was like, I can't listen to anybody else. I have to just do this on my own. Um, so and I do you, not... do you think you have to be incredibly driven to be in this industry? A hundred percent. Even now, even with, uh, with a career behind me and, and I have so many more things that I want to do. Um, and I've been living out here independently for five years um, by myself. I have my own apartment in Hollywood and I'm working consistently. Even now, I, you know, 
people still don't really believe that it's it's necessarily possible and you still receive pushback every day even just from already being in the industry so i think if this is the career path you want to go into i think just having that drive and knowing exactly why you want to do it is so important it could be that you love it it could be that you aspire to to have a career like this it could be that you want to live in this country and you know that's you want to try this industry but you, whatever it is you have to be 100% committed because otherwise there is there is just no way you'll make a long term career you might do it for a few years but you will eventually receive so much pushback that unless you're ready to do this full time it's, it's, it would be very hard to, to continue for sure and when you say pushback do you mean people saying to you you can't do it you know here are the reasons and we're you know we're we're, we're telling you to stop this yeah definitely that um i mean especially family members and friends anybody who isn't um who isn't in the industry are always gonna have questions and always going to try and push you to have something that's more stable or something that in their mind is is valid i think that's the biggest thing for me if you're around people that have been in the performing arts or have been in the industry they can recognize that as a viable career there's a lot of people that just don't don't understand it enough to know that there's so many different options in that industry that you can go into and it's a very very viable and necessary career path if we if we didn't have artists what would we be doing in quarantine right now all we're doing is netflix and music and shows and concerts like the arts have funny enough become so vital that i think it's shocking that people still don't see it as a viable career oh, path. absolutely um I don't on top of that of course pushback just from the sheer level of competition you're not applying to be a receptionist or an administrator or an accountant this is you know this is a kind of once in a lifetime career that you it's it's going to be hard to get there but once you get there it's you know and, and looking at all your credits abby it's it's really inspiring and you know i wonder what do you think you've got that gets you the gig why have you been getting the jobs that's a really good question. Um, for me, and I think kind of reflecting on myself and also speaking to a lot of my clients, funny enough, uh, my choreography, I'm very skilled in, in my choreography and I've done a lot of different jobs and I'm very versatile. So when I meet an artist, it could be a hip hop artist or a jazz artist or um, someone who wants something very feminine or masculine, I really know how to understand people. So I make sure that before I even start choreographing, I understand what the artist wants. Um, yeah. And being personable and being engaging enough with them that they trust to show me who they are, I think that's definitely my, my greatest skill because there's been so many times I've been on a job and they've called me and they've said, I want this, 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 and this, and then they send me the song. And I think, hmm. I don't think that they really understand that th this is what it's going to look like. So a lot of times I'll bring in my dancers or I'll bring in my assistant and I'll come with a plan A and plan B, something that I think, and then also what they've asked for. 95% of the time, it will be the plan B. So I always come prepared with two. And that definitely sets me apart because there's a lot of people that just do the job. They see it as a job, get in, get out. I mean, I'm sure the job was fantastic, but that has ensured... A lot of the clients that I've been working with, I've been working with for four to five years now. They they book me, they hire me, and then they stay they stay with me for everything. Um, yeah, you know, which is which gives me the longevity and keeps me working even during a time like this. I haven't had to worry necessarily about looking for new work because all my current artists are still doing mini projects. Um, so I definitely say just the engage, being able to engage with people and lots of different people um, and being able to kind of put your emotions about a project aside and really just find out what that person wants and what will make them feel happy because it's not about me or it's not about the dancers at the end of the day it's what does the artist feel happy with what has been created to their piece of music it's very personal to them so that was yeah that, that's you know that's something that you wouldn't often hear from choreographers we, i hear it often from people who write songs for artists but it's really yeah brilliant abby to hear that from a from somebody who's choreographing but do you think that's because and do excuse the phrase but do you think it's because you're not a one-trick pony that you're getting these gigs yeah definitely um i think the, the fact that i can pull from so many different genres definitely brings a new level to my choreography and i'm also not too proud to seek help when i need it for example um I think it was about two months ago, I had an African artist, traditional African artist contact okay. me. I am not versed in African style, nor do, nor am I going to claim to be, nor am I going to go on YouTube, 
learn the trendiest African grooves and moves and then label them as my own. I don't, I don't agree with that. So I called my friend who is excellent at the African style. I said, can you come into the studio with me? I'll pay you. And can you help me out? So then when I send back the finished product, I'm honoring the style that has been asked of, but I'm also bringing my professional, um, you know, my professional view on, on the products and kind of combining them. So I'm never too proud to ask someone and say, no, this is my full expertise. Can you come in and, and, and give me some, some tips and make sure that it, it honors the style that we're doing. And, and honoring the style is so important. Don't you think? Yes. So important. And I, I think that's being lost a little bit nowadays, especially with TikTok and Instagram. Absolutely. And, there's, um, there's something that I've been seeing recently and um, a choreographer that I look up to has been speaking on it. There's a, there's a move that is an original light feet move and light feet is a, um, is a footwork style that is okay. and it's same as, you know, house or a traditional hip hop. It, it's very, yeah. very uh, deep rooted in, in culture. And this move has somehow made it onto the TikTok scene. And every time you see a new TikTok dance, they have this move and you know it's been brought up like wh why are people just taking this one move adding it into this dance and this dance has no cultural resemblance of what this move represents or the foundation of this style um so i really try to honor as much as i can whatever style i'm i'm working with i think it's very and i think important. it's so important to to look at the social and historical context of these genres yes. and yes. and and then that gives you know that gives you the stylistic feature for yes. the genre and that's what yes. sets it apart and i wonder you know we certainly find in the, in in scotland that there there is seems to be the need to maybe over sexualize dance moves with um mm -hmm. in commercial work um and, and it, it, it i i'm not a fan of it it doesn't really work for me as an educator um mm -hmm. and i don't like to see it either and i know we're all talking about on twitter or at the moment especially um about the cuties film that's on netflix yeah. but keeping yeah. that aside for one moment because i'm sure we'll get to that but keeping that aside for one moment what would you say to teenagers who are being trained perhaps in the commercial way which has definitely decided to sexualize dance moves at a younger age when we could be enjoying moves that are appropriate for the age and mm -hmm. for the song what, what would you say to young dancers about that is that something they, sh they should be doing or should they be looking for doing that I think And I think that people should be focusing on technique, strength, execution, tour. I, I would always say like, if you can look at a tour uh, or watch like Ariana Grande tour or Janet Jackson tour, yeah. and the, you, will, you will see there's always, you know, the, oftentimes there is some sexualized movement, but the, the people that are dancing on these tours have so much strength and integrity behind their movement. Of course, mm -hmm. when you get older and you start doing professional jobs, there is a time and a place where you may have of to course. do a little bit more sexual or you may have to put a heel on or dance Absolutely. with a male or a female or a male male um there's a time and a place for that i would say in the training field i think that that is very distracting towards becoming a versatile well-trained strong dancer um if i see if i'm hiring dancers and i have to use social media a lot at the moment because no auditions are happening if yeah. i see a dancer that is only posting sexualized content especially if they're a younger dancer i will not hire them because i do not know if they are able to do for example a more masculine style if they are sure. able to do something more technical or even just to know their integrity as a dancer i want to know that they can do everything now if i put a heel on and you are of the appropriate age and you're yes, expecting absolutely. to make a sexual performance then that that is for a purpose within that specific routine for that performance being in class and doing so much over sexualized stuff i think that it's it's taking away from the the real integral training that we should be having especially when we're not of age to be dancing like that yet and then yeah. putting it on social media for everybody everybody to, to see it's um that for me if you're going to be doing sexualized dancing i want to be paid for that because i'm using my yeah. body as an art form and I'm eliciting maybe a feeling from somebody else. That for me Absolutely. requires a check. You will not see yes. me doing that on social media. 
unless it's a very classy feminine version that I've learned in a class. I'm not going to be doing that for everybody to see. I want, I want to be paid for that kind of performance. So I think I want to applaud you, Abby, because that is, you know, I think that's what we need to hear. And I think our youngsters need to hear that. Um, I have a a question for me. Normally we take questions from our students at this point, but our director of dance um, has a question for you this evening. So this comes from Diane Aspinall. Mm -hmm. um, And Diane would really like to clear something up. Um, Mm -hmm. She's danced all over the world. She's been teaching for maybe I shouldn't say how long she's been teaching for, but it's certainly about 30 years. And, you know, we often have this discussion about what commercial dance is and you know commercial music commercial dance is what is current at the moment so whatever was commercial in the 60s was what was current commercial dance doesn't necessarily have to be and i also i worry about terms like hip-hop because you know hip-hop is is one genre of of, of music that has a certain type of movement associated with it. Mm-hmm. How do you feel about the term commercial? I, to me, I, I view the term commercial as something for a commercial purpose. So for me, a commercial style of dance is something, for example, say you see um, uh, like a vacuum or a Hoover, a Hoover advert and the, yes. the people that are dancing around it are selling a commercial product. A tour, yeah. for example, if there's backing dancers on a tour and it's popular music like Ariana Grande, they're selling a commercial product. So for me, that's what the word commercial means. It's usually to do with gaining some kind of money, selling something, creating a, an image that would be, um, that would be, what's the word? That would be liked by a large spectrum yes. of General, large, the general, a wide public. demographic, yeah. A wide demographic. It's not niche. It's not very specific. It's something that is very mass appealing, that looks very good and looks very visually stimulating and appealing. That is what I would say commercial is. That's, that's fabulous. And, and so that then would cross an awful lot of dance genres, depending on what was required. Is that right? Correct. Um, I mean, I have, I have friends that um, do Chicago footwork that have also have been asked to do that style for something that I would then consider a commercial purpose. That does not mean that the Chicago footwork style has been taken away and that does not mean it's commercial dance, but it does mean that they have used that for a commercial purpose. So I'd still say if they did that on an advert or a TV show for something that's not necessarily promoting the culture of that dance, I would say that would still be considered in part commercial. So I don't think the, when people say the commercial dance style, I think for me, if I'm referring to what I would say is jazz funk commercial, I call it tourography because I believe that Mm -hmm. that is, that is a different word that represents that specific style of dance that is very music video style and very popular. Um, But I think the word commercial can be applied to a lot more things than we really have kind of coined that term to be nowadays. Yeah. Wow. You're like an encyclopedia. That was fabulous. (laughs) (laughs) And you know, Do you, I mean, you are so informed, Abby. You really are. And it's so refreshing to hear, okay? How important do you think that is for our young dancers, you know, who are studying? Let's say you're training in dance at the moment. How how important is it that you are so informed? It's... It's got me where I am today. And I I don't say that lightly. I'm very good at what I do. I'm not the best in the world. I'm not the best dancer. I'm actually, I don't consider myself an excellent dancer. I'm a good dancer. I'm not excellent. Now I'm an excellent choreographer. So I know my, I know my strength and I know where to use it. Now, what's got me where I am today is being able to have conversations, being informed about the industry, being able to write an email, being able to negotiate a contract, um, being able to see something on a contract and think that doesn't look quite right. And being informed enough within myself and within, for example, uh, here we have Screen Actors Guild, um, the union in, in England, being able to uh, be informed about what's on trend and what's current. And I definitely think that that's got me where I am today. I have no problem um, having a tough conversation with a director or having a tough conversation with an agent because I know that I'm informed enough to to carry myself in that conversation, whether it's a good outcome or a bad outcome. I think that 
especially in the industry nowadays, people are so desperate to work and to get these jobs and to get yeah. this agent that we just say, yes, 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 yes. And then yeah. we feel empty because we know we've been sold short and then our careers aren't, don't end up being as long as they should be because we've just said yes and nodded along instead of kind of taking action on our, on our own path and saying, this is what I want and it's going to be harder. It might take me longer, but I'm going to be in control of my own career. Um, and I've been, even recently I was on a job and I hired 10 dancers and I actually, the job was going into overtime, which they had told us is absolutely going to be no overtime because we're definitely going to be finished on time. How many times do we hear that in life? Um, (laughs) And I had to go in front of the director, the entire team and the artist, because there was nobody there to represent us because it was a non-union gig and say, Hey, we're about to in 30 minutes, we're about to go into overtime and my dancers and myself, we're not going to be able to complete the job unless you sit here and negotiate some overtime. And the funniest thing was it was the the artist was having a meltdown. She was not happy, but not only did that spur me to receive overtime for myself and the dancers, then the director also negotiated overtime off the back of me being the one that was able to to speak up um and he actually came to me afterwards and said thank you for speaking and thank you for making sure that everybody got their adequate pay um so little things like that if i say i had not been in the position to do that or i didn't know my rights um that you know because i sent her a contract as well so she she knew exactly what she was working with if i hadn't done that that means that the dancers may have had a bad impression of me because they had to do more work than they were initially assigned for I would have left the job feeling angry which I never want to do I love my job I would have left feeling mad because I would have been paid less than the time that I was there for yes um so little little things like that um shameless plug I'm actually writing an ebook right now with all these different things um how to negotiate contracts how to write an email how to approach an agent i'm actually in the middle of writing that right now so i'll definitely send it over to you once oh it's that's fantastic and will um, you come back on the show so we can discuss it as well yeah definitely i love that oh, yeah so that's brilliant. been one of my quarantine projects because i i think there's so much information and nobody is giving these information giving this information to the young dancers they can start whilst they're in school they can start learning how to read a contract they can start learning how to write an excellent email that these are things that they can be doing as as homework Um, yeah and and i think it's it's interesting because um at lost entertainment academy we have many um performing arts courses and yet it is the music and the musical theater courses that have more business associated Mm -hmm. with them so i think it's important that that we you know we we do that you know just listening to you it's firing me up a little bit and and I, i want to ask you what would you say were the top three professional qualities that a dancer needs to have um that's a really good question put you on the spot uh, number, <laughs> yeah number one i think would be professionalism that has to be the biggest one knowing how to act on a job knowing what isn't isn't appropriate being on time um knowing how to be around an artist especially if it's a famous artist knowing how to or you know just how to how to be professional on a job that would be number one number two would be integrity i yeah. think um that's a, it's a huge quality and a skill you're entering into an industry where there's many blurred lines, um, you know, that you're going to be presented with a lot of opportunities and a lot of, a lot of things that can sway who you are and what your goal is. So number two would be integrity. Um, number three, I would say, um, people skills, people skills, being able to engage and speak to and understand a, a wide range of people and being able to have conversations, um, with them without necessarily, you know, bringing too much of your personal feelings into it and uh yeah wow and and when you you know if 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 we were to look back together on on your career and and let's not beat about the bush here you know you are you're choreographing you're you're writing um you're touring you're dancing you're you're representing commercial project uh, projects yeah. Yeah. you know this is some career that you have had already and yeah. uh, you know i have no doubt that you're going to be just shooting up that climb um yeah. further and further as 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 you get back into work um you know as as it should be in a in sort of normal day to day circumstances yeah. but if you were to just stop for a moment and and think about what the view would be because i know that there will be many people that watch this podcast who are going to go 
wow, oh, we could never be her. You know, she's amazing. What, what would you look back and see and, and what would you think was amazing? And what would you think was just fabulous? Just the decision to, to do it, I think, is the most fabulous thing. It's even these younger students, like just the, the choices they're making to go into an industry that is, is so scary and is so competitive. Yeah. I think, you know, they're doing something that, that many other people would be so terrified to do. I think it's incredible to see young people still continuing to decide to, to pursue a career in the arts. Without them, we wouldn't have any future in the Absolutely. arts. So I think anybody that's making a decision to go for something that is a little bit risky, I think that's the most fabulous thing. We, we need people like that in the world. We need lots of them. <laughs> and what, what kept you going, Abby? You know, when times were tough, what kept you going? Um, just the love for it. I just, there's no other feeling than being on set or being on stage or watching something come to life. I just, I, I can't replace it. So whenever it gets tough, I, we'll try and create uh, with some friends or I'll just get into the studio myself or I'll watch old videos of pieces that I've created. And yeah, just the sheer love for, for the choreography and the, the dances, um, it keeps me going every day. And, and that just, it just oozes out of you, darling. It really does. What, what do you think you would say to all those people who wanted to push you back from this, who wanted to stop you from doing this, who had better advice for you? What would you say to them now? I would just say I wish that they had done their research to help me. Um, you know, I never expected anybody to be fully supportive. I don't think we can ever really expect someone to fully push us on a journey that they don't know anything about. That's our responsibility um, to do what we're choosing to do with our life. I just wish there was more people around me that had looked into what I was saying that I wanted to do and look at the options and say, okay, if you really want to do this, you know, how about let's get you into, how about a business degree? Or how about you know, like other things that would have still aligned with where I was going. I just, yeah, yeah I just wish that people listen to younger people more. You, you know, if somebody comes to you and says, I want to be a rocket scientist, I don't see how anyone can turn around and say, no, you can't do that. They might say, well, let's start researching. That's going to be very competitive. Yeah. But these are, the, these are the options and maybe you can get an internship here or maybe you can start, you know, researching this. I, I just wish that um, educators were more readily available to help young people instead of trying to stifle them at such a young age it's it's really sad to see i think well de don't get me started it de it, it definitely <laughs> is yeah. and what would you say to the to the to the dancer who who wants to dance and the teacher who wants to teach and the the teacher who wants to learn and the dancer who wants to teach and all these different things what would you say to them when they sometimes feel gosh i'm Am I ever going to, I'm ever going to be somebody? Mm -hmm. What would you say would, to them? Just, I would say just keep going and just do it. Um, I think, especially in our industry, there's this real focus on being young and doing this while you're so young. You can teach until you're 60, 70, 80 years old. You can choreograph at 50, 60. You can choreograph and then become a creative director. I know people that are still touring at the age of 40. You know, and, and then they go on to do other things. I think there's there's no one avenue for everybody. And if you know what sets your heart on fire and you, you just know that that's what you want to do, I would say just do it. It doesn't even matter if you feel a little bit older, you miss that that little window that you think you had. I think that's just not true. If you want to do it, just, just keep doing little steps. One thing a day, one little thing a day, even if it seems insignificant. And a few years later, it will have built into something grander that you probably didn't even realize you could could have done you know and I think for me you know l l listening to you and, and and as I say having done the research that I have done on you you are such an inspiration Abby you are you are so full of fun packed sound bites and knowledge and encouragement for everybody and I really feel that you you are quite a role model for for anybody of any age wanting to go into this pr profession and wanting to dance, wanting to choreograph and wanting to create. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I really feel that across the performing arts, it is our duty to mentor people who want to to do that, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And interestingly, our uh, younger students, pupils, and um, some of our 
older students and a couple of teachers wanted to put something together for you um, and obviously in social distance times as well yeah. uh, just to show you that just to show you that um, our ethos is really about looking out for each other and, and, and daring to, to dream big so we're going to see that just at the end uh, and we've coupled it up with some uh, a rather famous voiceover actually so um, I hope you enjoy that and, and I really hope that you you can continue to be the most incredible mentor and and you know somebody who's really trying to change the way people think about dance and that's how I that's how I see you if if you had one wish, Abby, if you had one wish for your future career, what would it be? <laughs> You're going to get me with that question. Um, I want, there's so many things that I want, <laughs> but I think I want to see my work on the grandest scale. Um, I want to see my work on a world tour of somebody huge. And I want it to be seen by millions of people, but I want it to be work that has integrity and work that says something about who I am. And you know, you can distinguish it from other people's work. Um, I don't know what that's going to look like. I'm still kind of in the beginning stages out here. Um, so I, I'm hoping that within the next three to four years, that is the level that I will, will be at. Um, so I'm not sure who the artist will be at that point. But uh, yeah, I want my work to be on tours so that it's seen around the world. Um, and for people to be just inspired by my story and be able to see somebody that's done something that, that they didn't think possible um, and, and use that to push themselves forward. Well, I, I can't wait for all the people who are going to see this podcast to look back at that time, darling, and say that they heard it here first, because <laughs> you will, you will. I am, I have no doubt that you will. And I cannot wait to see that. And I can't wait to experience all that you have got ahead of you. I have to thank you, Abby. You've just been incredible. I, 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 don't know what I imagined this interview would be like because <laughs> I, I suppose you're you're very famous, you know. I, but but wow, this has just been so insightful and so informative. And and I have to thank you from the bottom of my heart. You are truly living the fabulous life. And so much so that I noticed that on our screen tonight, our producer has stayed on as well. <laughs> <laughs> and um and our producer also has a dance background so it's been very very interesting and and just to finish off tonight i i hope you enjoy the the small piece that we've we've put together for you from the, from the call. <laughs> so from lost entertainment academy to you abby and oliver and from me the fabulous tt tish tindall from the fabulous life all the very best darling you are inspiring thank, thank, thank you, you so much me. darling no thank so you much. so much thank you
The one thing I don't like is that people who have a platform who say, I'm not a role model. And it's like, you you have a choice. Then don't be out there. Because if you are being seen in any way, shape, or form, there is somebody looking up to you. And I want young people to realize that mentorship starts early and it starts right in your own backyard. For every young person who's listening to this conversation, I don't care if you're 12 or 10, there's somebody younger who is watching you. (laughs) They are watching how you carry yourself, how you laugh, how you make fun of things, what you wear. There is always somebody right behind you looking at how to be. And in that way, we have to carry ourselves with the knowledge that we're, we're always setting the tone for people behind us. We are always um, in somebody's line of sight.